Honorable members have also uh, been informed uh, that uh, uh, in accordance with Council Rule 291, there will be no notice of motion or motions without, without notice. Um, we will now proceed to questions, but before we do so, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the minister, uh, ministers uh, from the Peace and Security, security Clusters, uh, uh, ministers and, and, and uh, 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 who come from the Peace and Security Cluster, specifically the Minister of Home Affairs, uh, Dr. Aron Mtsoledi, and the Minister of International, then the Deputy Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, uh, Honorable Portes, as well as all permanent delegates, MECs, and special delegates to the to the House. Uh, just to emphasize, as you usually, usually do, uh, I would like to remind delegates that in terms of Rule 229 of the Council Rules, the time for reply by the ministers and the deputy, deputy ministers in this, in, this, in this case, to a question is five minutes. Um, only four supplementary questions are allowed per question. Thirdly, a member who has asked the initial question would be the first to be afforded an opportunity to ask a supplementary question. Fourthly, the time for asking a supplementary question is two minutes. Fifthly, the time for reply to a supplementary question is four minutes. And lastly, as we always emphasize, the supplementary question must emanate from the initial question. It can be different. Uh, uh, we will then proceed to, to, to questions. And I'll ask the Minister of Home Affairs to take note the podium. Um, the first question is question 285. 285. The question is on measures to curb abuse of e-visa. Uh, this question comes from Honorable Ndongeni uh, from, the, from the Eastern Cape and is directed to the Minister of Home Affairs. Uh, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Maybe for ease of reverence, I need to explain the whole concept of e-visa. Ordinarily, when people come to South Africa from countries that need an e-visa to come here, they go to the mission of South Africa in that particular country to apply for a visa. Sometimes it can be very inconvenient. In countries like China, there are people who have to travel a thousand kilometers just to apply. So in order to make it easier for them to visit South Africa, we introduce the e-visa system where you apply online in the comfort of your own home. And if you are accepted, you receive an email, which you take and rush to the airport. That's how easy it is. But unfortunately, yes, there are people who are abusing this system. So for us to mitigate against abuse, we do verification requesting the banks to verify bank statements that are supplied by the people who are applying. And for those applications where financial institutions do not respond, the matter is referred to the mission or embassy for verification purposes. Also, those who indicate that they are visiting, they are being hosted in South Africa by friends or family, we actually look for the details to confirm because we have found this at the airport where somebody claimed that they are visiting family or a particular friend, but when we phone such a friend, we discover that they don't even exist. Further verifications are done with accommodation, where the resorts, hotels, bed and free breakfast and other holiday accommodation are conducted to confirm the stay of such a tourist or visitor. We also did this because there are people who code names of hotels or resorts where they are going to go 
only to find that the hotels know nothing about, but worse still for the hotels, because many of them have complained about people who apply, uh, who, 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 who arrange for accommodation with them and they are given, but they never arrive. So it is because of those that we decided to, to take uh, the measures that we are taking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first supplementary question will come from Honorable Ndongen. Ndongen. Thank you, Chairperson. Afternoon, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for your response to my question. It is really encouraging to see the different measures that are put in place to stop and possible abuse of the system. Honorable Minister, what will happen to foreign nationals when the department discover on their arrival in the country that they have given incorrect information or have tried to abuse the system. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable, Honorable Minister. Yeah. Yes, in, in that case, when we discover that, and we do a lot at the airport, we do discover a lot at the airport, we send them back home. We can't allow them to, to enter the country. And uh, this is in terms of the Immigration Act. If they were brought in by a conveyancer, there are conveyancers who do that, meaning people who transport people across the borders, whether they are airlines, whether they are uh, 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 land transport, they do do such things. And in terms of the Immigration Act, we actually charge them. We levy a fee. We we, we, there's, there's a penalty for bringing somebody here who's not supposed to be here, and they must go back home at the cost of the airliner. So once we discover all these problems, you we actually go back. You won't be allowed in the country because we'll discover them before you officially enter the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. The second supplementary question will come from Honorable Badenhorst. Honourable Minister, it's, it's hard to believe that somebody is actually abusing a system that, that very often doesn't actually work. If you look at um, as recently as four months ago, nearly 60% of e-visa applications were rejected because of the travel date had already passed, which basically means that your department has failed to process those applications in time, 60% of all applications. This is just another example of how your department's ineffectiveness continued to add barriers to our tourism sector. Minister, after election promises were made in 2019 that tourism will be promoted to, to the continent, would you regard the recent Africa Visa Openness Index ranking South Africa as 33rd out of 54 African countries as a suitable scorecard for your term of office as the Minister of Home Affairs? Thank you. Minister? Yeah, person, you know, this exaggeration over visas must come to an end. There is a story yesterday in business day about the same thing. I'm going to respond to that. In this world, 134 countries don't need visas to come to South Africa. They don't. They just come. It is 44 countries in Europe, which is the biggest market. They just come as long as they've got a passport. It is 36 countries on the African continent that include the whole of SADC. They don't need any visas to visit South Africa. It is 20 countries in Asia. It is 19 countries in North America. It is 11 countries in South America and three in Oceania. If you add, you understand your mathematics, 134 countries. The remaining 34 around the world, we give them an e-visa to make it simple. I want to present this documentation at the recently held conference on tourism attended by the Minister of Tourism at Sun City. And the tourist sector was happy. They were even interviewed and said the situation has improved dramatically and they are happy about it. So if the people who are running that business are happy, who are you and what are you complaining about? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. We will proceed to the next question from Honorable Tuffany. Honorable Tuffany. Uh, uh, thank you. Honorable, Honorable Ogham. 
Honorable Thank Owusu. you, House Chair. Thank you, House Chair. You know, we, uh, we, we never objected to people heckling, making some noises here and there and so on. And then it's just been, it's, it's just been deliberate. Uh, because we don't want people to feel stifled. That in the NSOP, you know, uh, they're not allowed to air their views or to shout a bit here and there. But we have said consistently that if you heckle to the extent that we can't hear the speaker or you're involved in a dialogue with the person who's answering the questions from the minister, etc., uh, uh, then there's something wrong with that. So I'm going to urge uh, all honorable members to please engage reasonably uh, with the speaker so that we can be able to do the work that is in front uh, of us. Please, please. Uh, so the next uh, question comes from Honorable Tafeni. Honorable Tafeni? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Minister, one of the main reasons why the system has been subject to abuse is because some of the documents uploaded on the portal by applicants were fake, and this department lacks the internal capacity to detect the real from the fake. And in some instances, your own officials at Home Affairs work in co-host with foreigners foreigners nationals to grant them entry into the country in light of this what measures have you put in place to verify all information or document uploaded by applicant what in the departmental intelligence is applied to filter through those applica applications where people may lie through the e-visa process i thank you honorable Jefferson. Minister? Chairperson, when earlier this year we caught 67 Pakistani nationals at OR Tambo International Airport, and the following day we caught 11 at Cape Town International Airport, is because our systems are working. They were abusing the visas, and I'm not going to stand here in front of you and deny that there is a lot of corruption in home affairs. That's why home affairs is the only government department in the whole country that has got a whole DDG with a whole branch who are in charge of counter corruption. And that's why we are able to catch people. The fact, I mean, this, this noise here that is being made, that 60% of visas have been rejected. Let me tell you, if 60% of the visas are wrong and fraudulent, we'll reject them. If 100% are wrong and fraudulent, we reject them. So what is the magic about 60%? And I've already informed you about the status of countries around the world in terms of tourism. There is a, a leader in the National Assembly who made noise about an education conference whereby a certain number of people from a country on this continent, visas were rejected. And they made a similar noise. And I want to show them that all the documents that were given to us were fraudulent. Why should we approve them if they are fraudulent? We won't do so. So we do accept that there is a lot of corruption, but we do catch them. Believe you me, if our systems were not working, the people will return from OR Tambo and from Cape Town International Airport. We will not have returned them back. And you can go to Home Affairs. I'll give you a list of all the people who have charged and fired and given over to the Hawks who were doing some of these shenanigans who worked for Home Affairs. In the portfolio committee, we present such statistics every, I mean, quite often when we meet them. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll then move on to Honorable DeBrain, the fourth supplementary question. Honorable DeBrain. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, my question that I had prepared was asked already by from the previous members, but I will ask the Minister, um, Honorable Minister, according to reports from the first term in, of this year, about 58% of e-visas were rejected 
because the travel dates has passed before the department could process the applications. Now, Honorable Minister, what was the reason for the e-visas or the e-visa applications that could not be could not have been processed in time at that stage? And what is the current situation in this regard? Are the e-visas being processed in time today? Thank you. The, the whole essence of e-visas is to make it faster for people to enter this country. That's why all the international conferences we have had, like BRICS, we never had any problems. It always runs smooth. I've got an open line with the Minister of Trade and Industry. Every time people want to visit here for business purposes, if there are problems with, e with visas, e-visas or otherwise, Minister Patel gives me a list and we deal with that. This story of 60%, I hear it's being bonded around. And uh, 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 if, if at all it happened, maybe it's a once-off glitch because the e-visa is new. We, we were still piloting it. But otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, the figures we got on e-visa shows that the system is working very well. Save the people who want to 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 cause problems with it, and once they they do so, we stop that country, we stop the whole e visa system to Pakistan because of what we saw at the airport. We no longer allow them to come in via the e visa. They must have, it's not that will stop them from coming in, but they must apply for visas in the old method because when we try to to be efficient, they try to abuse it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the next question. And this is question 276. The question is on South African born abroad and or naturalized. Uh, this question comes from uh, 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 F.J. Badenhorst and is directed to the Minister of Home Affairs. Minister? Yes. Honorable member, I don't want to undermine the manner in which you ask the question, but I think there's something to clarify here, which I think many people are aware of. And when I read this question, I got that feeling that you might not be aware of that. If you are, please forgive me. When you say a South African born abroad, and you put them in the same category as naturalized citizens, it becomes confusing. If you are a South African and you are born abroad, you can't be a naturalized citizen. You are a South African. And actually, even if you have never set foot in South Africa, doesn't matter which part of the world you are born in. If one of your parents, just one, is a South African, doesn't matter where you are born. You immediately become a South African and not a naturalized one, a South African like you and me. That system is called juice sanguinis. Sanguine is a Latin word for blood. It means the right of blood. It means we are born there and through your blood, you belong to that country. We took that system, by the way, uh, because we were colonized by the British. They, were, they are using the same system. The opposite system to that, which is the one that is confusing people, is called Jews solely from soil, the right of the soil. It means you are born on that soil and you have got the right of that soil. We don't use that system here in South Africa. In fact, the whole of Europe, they don't, they use, use juice sanguinous except Luxembourg. The whole of Asia use juice sanguinous except Pakistan, which is using juice solely. Here on the African continent, we are all using juice sanguinous, the right of blood, except Lesotho, Tanzania, Chad, and, and Cape Verde, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's Cape Verde. So, so naturalized citizens are people who belong to other countries, who come here and through a legal process they get naturalized to become South Africans. I think having clarified that, let me go to the details of the question. Yes, it is true uh, uh, that there, there were some problems with that. Uh, we are taking steps at the moment, as I'm speaking, to verify all documents on the database for naturalized citizens for accuracy and completeness. The same leave capture system used for the issuance of smart cards for citizens by birth will be used to issue smart ID cards for naturalized citizens. Remember, 
there are South Africans themselves who don't the smart ID cards. Not everybody who has got it. The smart ID card was introduced only in 2013. At the time of introduction, 39 million South Africans had to be moved, migrated from the green barcode ID document, the booklet, to the smart card. So that process is still going on and we want to include naturalized citizens. So the department is finalizing the process of the issuance of smart card to naturalized citizens. And as such, a communique to all affected individuals will be issued uh, in the next coming days to kickstart the process of replacing their green ID booklets with smart ID cards in exactly the same way that is happening to South Africans. It doesn't mean that all South Africans have got smart ID and it's only naturalized citizens that do not have. It's not like that. Chairperson, as I indicated earlier in this reply, the same system that is used in the live, live capture environment countrywide will be able to process in these smart ID cards. And I need to explain what I'm talking about when I said live capture environment. Not all our offices of home affairs can give you a smart card because they are not all modernized. And modernization depends on connectivity. You might be aware that the Minister of Telecommunications and New Technologies promised that they are going to con to establish, to implement something called South Africa Connect. And if I'm not mistaken, I read last week that they started implementing where rural hospitals, clinics, police stations, schools, including home affairs offices, will be connected. Once all home affairs offices are connected, they'll all be we all inst install the live capture and everybody will be able to get a, a, a smart ID card there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. Uh, follow up, first question come from Honorable Baron Horst. No, thank you, Minister. It's, um, it's just sad that, that every time you come to this house, um, words like finalizing, in the next coming days, it's in the process. We're waiting for somebody else. We're dependent on whatever else. When will you actually commit to a final timeline and exact dates of when these smart ID cards will be made available to these people? Because they've been waiting, as you said, so yourself. Started the process in 2013. It's 10 years later, and we're still waiting for smart ID cards. When will they actually get the minister? When will you commit to a timeline? Thank you. Minister, when we finish what we are doing here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the date. I'll announce and say, and we'll announce by writing to the individuals, not those who are not affected, who are just crumbling, the individuals who are directly affected. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, the second supplementary question, Honorable Dodobu. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Sir. I, I don't really have a question to, to the Minister. I want to commend him for his response and his vast knowledge of how the system works. I really appreciate that. If I was in my township in Jorgerton, I was going to say one class on Adit. And I would really want to thank him for that. Uh, out of his responses, we are very much educated. We now know better how the systems works. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. We'll proceed to the third supplementary question from Honorable Khatebe. Honorable Khatebe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister. It is an open secret that national departments struggle with uh, estab establishing and maintaining effective intergovernmental relations that will support and ensure the success of processes such as this. What step-by-step -step actions, if any, have already been taken and effected by you and your department to ensure harmony amongst your department and other departments or service providers to realize the success of this program that the Honorable Minister is talking about. Thank you. Minister. 
Chairperson, I'm not sure whether this is not a new question. I'm not sure you can make a ruling about it if it's not new, but then I'll have to be explained to you because I don't understand very well. He's talking about intergovernmental relations. Mm -hmm. And the question here is about giving smart ID cards to naturalized citizens. I don't know whether there's a relationship. Honorable Katebe, uh, to give another opportunity, um, is there anything that you want to say in relation to, your, to the question that we have posed? Um, anything at all that can assist? Honorable Chairperson, um, if the Department of Home Affairs um, is engaged in any program of issuing IDs and documents for citizens that are not in South Africa, surely there has to be a working relations with other departments in relation to that. So my question, my question um, revolves around that issue of working with other departments, how smooth it is, um, and uh, if there is any harmony um, in working with other departments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Chairperson, we work very closely with DERCO. In fact, when I say people apply in our missions abroad, I'm talking about embassies that are run by DERCO, controlled by an ambassador appointed by DERCO. In all of them, we appoint people from home affairs to sit in those missions and they report to the ambassador and they work together. But be that as it may, the present question, fortunately, the people we are talking about are in South Africa. They are all naturalized citizens. They've been given the citizenship of South Africa. Only that when Home Affairs gave smart ITs in 2013, they did not include them. They started first with South Africans. And we are now starting a process to make sure that they can also apply for smart ID cards. For that, we do not necessarily need any government department. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last supplementary question comes from Honorable Magwala. Honorable Magwala. Thank you, Chairperson of the Council. It's Honorable Mukawu. Oh, so sorry. Thank you, Please Chair. Um, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, Minister, uh, all these systems uh, that you have mentioned and mentioned that they've been integrated with other departments. Um, can you, um, from your side, um, assure us if they are also integrated with the immigration or the citizens' records? And if so, how is your department involved in making sure that the audits or the service providers which are appointed to actually verify this information uh, present to your department a totally clean and verified information? What is your role uh, in that regard? Thank you. Minister. Yeah, Chairperson, the, the reality <coughs> is that not our system, not all our systems are integrated. <coughs> we are battling very hard to try to make sure that all of them are integrated. For instance, we do not yet have integration with the Department of Justice between the divorce system of the Department of Justice. I mean, the, yes, and the the national population register we still do that manually people still come <laughs> so that that's one big problem we're trying to resolve but all the other systems like the national population register is integrated with the banks when you go to the bank today in south africa chairperson it's not like in the past where they look at your face look at your id no they take whatever information you give them they get into the computer, it sends them straight into the National Population Register, where your file appears 
in front of the, the, the banker and they are able to help you. Sasa is doing the same thing. Sasa no longer phones us when a person applies for Sasa because they are integrated with the National Population Register. Uh, the, the private industry, uh, uh, security industry regulatory authority, when people go to renew their licenses to be security officers, it's also directly linked to the National Population Register. What is not linked, which you are busy doing, and, and, and processes have, and acts and bills have already been sent to, 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 to cabinet to deal with this matter, is that we have got three databases in South Africa. The National Population Register, as I said, that records birth, death, marriage, ID, and passport. And that only applies to South Africans or naturalized citizens, even refugees and permanent residents. We now also have a system called NIIS, National Immigration Information System, which records only people who are here in South Africa, but are not South Africans. And, 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 and it's usually asylum seekers and refugees also who have not yet been fully integrated. The last system is called VAS, the Visa Adjudication System. That system is for anybody who in South Africa through a visa or a permit. And there are 17 such visas and permits. Any one of them, including the tourist visa, which was being spoken about here, the general work visa, uh, the visitor's visa, study visa, etc. All of them are in VAS. Now, what we are doing, we are introducing a new system called NIS, National Information System, where everybody who is within the borders of South Africa exists on the same system. That's what we are busy with. We have already finished the first phase of that because the first phase consists in changing the biometric system we have called ANIS to a modernized one called ABIS, which have got more biometrics. As I'm speaking now, all of you have been migrated to the new system. Uh, uh, whereby, because the present system only stores a fingerprint and, 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 and your photo, the new system has got five biometrics, including facial recognition. So we do have technology now that can recognize your face because we have finished that first part, I mean, first phase. Once we move to a second phase, we'll start integrating all the systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. We'll now move to the next question, uh, question 286. This question is on queues at service offices. Offices, Queues at service offices. The question comes from Honorable uh, Bartlett uh, and is directed to the Minister of, of Home Affairs. Honorable ba sorry, before we go to Honorable Bartlett, uh, Minister, yeah. Ch Chairperson, I must state that the solutions we are putting here to deal with long queues are symptomatic. In other words, we are dealing with the symptoms. The heart of the problem in long queues is the CETA systems that are always down. And we have already moved to other scientific organizations to help us. But be that as it may, in order to alleviate and mitigate at the present moment for the long queues, we have established a system called BAPS, Branch Appointment Booking System for Live Capture. That means for IDs and passport, whereby you book online to get a space in the Department of Home Affairs. So you only come at the time that is given to you. And most people who are using this system spend no more than 15 minutes in Home Affairs, obviating the problem of wrong queues. But we are also busy realizing that we depend on a third party, meaning a sister department, for connectivity, especially in rural villages, for connectivity of home affairs uh, 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 services, realizing that we thought we need to be on our own also while we are waiting. So we are intro introducing a virtual interactive self-service machine or a kiosk, which will be introduced in the nine modernized offices. That means the offices, especially in rural areas, who are not connected. According to this system, 
you save yourself. You get at a kiosk in the same way as you go to an ATM. You, you don't get into the bank. You don't need the bank teller to help you. You are able to get money. In this system, you'll be able to get your ID through this kiosk. It also depends on the facial recognition system that I spoke about. We are already piloting this. We have already ordered some of the kiosks, and we think they'll help very much. But I must say, those people who are taking an ID for the first time will not be able to use it. It's only for reissue, because people who are want a reissue, we have already processed them, we already know them, they are already within the system, they are genuine. Those who are new, we have still have to check their credentials before you give them IDs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Honorable uh, Bartlett, first supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Can I just ask the excuse for not uh, switching my video on? I'm not well. If, okay. if I may, Chairperson, can I proceed? Okay, thank you, Honorable Minister, for the response to my question. The virtual interactive self-service machine will go a long way in assisting to shorten, shorten the queues in the home affairs offices. Honorable Minister, has there been a pilot project or is the department planning to have a pilot project before the implementation of the machines and will they be user-friendly for those that are unfamiliar, unfamiliar with them? Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Thanks, Honorable Minister. Minister? Yes, indeed. There is ongoing pilot. It's about to come to an end because if you come up with new technology without piloting it, it will cause you a disaster. But in order to avoid that, we are. Yes, definitely, people who won't be able to use this technology will get people to help them in the same way we are you doing with BAPS already. There were questions because BAPS you book online about people who will not be well versed with the technology or who do not have the facilities to do so. In the home affairs offices that are using BAPS, when you arrive there, there's an iPad and a person who's made in that station where you can go in and they'll help you to book online. In other ways, they will do it for you. So in this case of, of the kiosk, we will definitely get people who will be there to show you how the system work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question comes from Honorable Debray. Honorable Debray. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Minister, this question has been asked repeatedly in this house over the last few years, and none of the previous answers you gave ever came to effect. Queues and service delivery at most home affairs offices nationwide are still in a dire strait or state. Honorable Minister, when will we actually see improvements in this regard? And can you commit to a time frame and a deadline for these improvements? Thank you. Minister? Chair Chairperson, if he is talking about long queues, I've already mentioned it in this house. I accept that. It's a big headache. And uh, together with CETA, we came to present in front of the Portfolio Committee on Home Affairs about steps that have been taken. Some already have been implemented. Others are still going to be implemented, like CETA refreshing all their networks for 400 million rand, which they've already started. That's not in our hands. It's in the hands of CETA. Uh, and uh, they also redoing their systems countrywide. And they said they are doing a 1 billion rand project. We're still waiting. But we are saying because those matters are out of our hands, in the meantime, we'll be doing what we can. That's why we are introducing, we have introduced the BAP system, and that's why we are going to introduce the kiosks. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The third supplementary question comes from Honorable Tafeni. It's Mokause, Chair. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Minister, you have for years mentioned that... Uh, you have actually declared war against long queues and home affairs. Yet to date, you have failed to eradicate long queues at this department. Um, Honorable Minister, why are you not partnering with other departments and have 
permanent working satellites based in these communities, like taking the home affairs to communities. Why are you not having a team of professionals who are assisting at the level of the towns, townships, and rural communities? You would agree with me that home affairs is not only issuing IDs, but home affairs is also issuing a lot of certificates uh, including a nightmare of a uh, death certificate. Some of these uh, families can't even afford to go to town and, and get their issues resolved. Why are you not taking your services to the people and making sure that all these documents reaches our people where they live? Thank you. Minister, actually I'm doing so, Chairperson. From August last year, I go out with the mobile units because they are much better than the legacy offices. They've got all the equipment, in, including an inbuilt generator. Now, Home Affairs has always been having hundreds of these mobile units. We have added 20 and we have added another 100 which are being manufactured in Kebeha, in Roslin, and in Itequini. And they are going to deliver them next month. We will keep them. I do go out with them. On Friday, I spent the whole day in Maruleng municipality in Skoror because they only go to Zanin and Palavrov IDs. And 235 people were served within a period of three days. Next week, I'll be going to Bushpark Ridge and before the end of the year, I'll end in Seabuso. So we do go around and it works very well. And we took, we made a decision that in order to deliver services very well, it is better to rely on mobiles because they move around and they are all connected. And we found them extremely useful. And indeed, they offer all the services. They can't give you the old ID card because they are modernized. They'll give you a smart card. But I also want to add, Chairperson, we have also started opening home affairs offices in hospitals. Out of the 4,000 public hospitals and clinics in South Africa, 1,444 of them, sorry, 1,440, birth is taking place there. And we have targeted them to put home affairs offices there. And the last time I counted, out of the hospitals we have targeted, we were left with 91 so that in those hospitals where we have put home affairs offices, when the mother goes home with the child, they also go home with a birth certificate. That is what is happening. Last week when I was in Skoron, there is a lady who told me that she's a beneficiary of that. She went to the hospital to be deliver a baby. She did not even know. The nurses told her that there is a home affairs office there. Because in hospitals where there's space, we put the home affairs offices opposite the labor on so that when the woman comes out with a baby, they will see written home affairs there. Where they are not able to give us a room next to the labor ward, we put it somewhere within the hospital vicinity, but we ask the nurses to please help. So we are doing that for people to get documentation. Lastly, Chair, it will be a tragedy if somebody is able to bear it their beloved ones, because Home Affairs has not been able to give them a, best, a death certificate rather. We don't allow that shit. I mean, you can imagine in some religions you die, they want to bury you within five hours. What will happen if Home Affairs can't be ready? So when it comes to death, we issue certificates, we can even issue them manually so that the person can be buried, and then you come back and get a computerized death certificate. But when it comes to death, uh, we, even during COVID, when we close quite a number of offices, when it comes to death certificate, we have got to make sure that is issued. So that is one document that we make sure that everybody gets because it will be very tragic if that was not to be so. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, the last supplementary question comes from Honorable Badenhorst. Well, Minister, thank you very much. The fact remains that cues are a symptom of the disease that is departmental failure. 
if you work at any of the home affairs service centers, you should actually have the words, the system is down, tattooed on your forehead. And you mentioned it now. You said CETA is the issue. And I'm very glad that you mentioned CETA because you stood in the same house two years ago and said exactly the same thing. You said CETA, and I'm going to quote you, Minister, is the original sin of home affairs. Did you say that? CETA is the original sin of home affairs and that you, as the Minister, are working with Treasury to exempt home affairs, like at that stage you said Treasury uh, uh, is exempted from using CETA, but rather using private IT companies. This is born, uh, and I'm worried about this, Minister, because CETA, listening to you talking about CETA, if you, if you listen to CETA, they say that it's not, it's not the, uh, their responsibility. They say that, in fact, the, the downtime, if you look at the downtime between, between CETA and Home Affairs, there's no correlation. So CETA is saying, you are not investing in infrastructure. Minister, I think you've wasted two years seeking exemption for something that's not going to solve the problem. When the problem is actually your home affairs under investment in ICT, is it not so? Thank you. Minister? Well, I think that's your opinion. That's definitely your opinion. It is not a secret that government departments do have problems with CETA. It's not a secret. And CETA has just acquired a new CEO who seems to be grappling with the problem from what I heard uh, a few weeks ago. I never said CETA is the original scene. I said the original scene in home affairs is this issue of system downtime because we are using sister system. It is true and it's a fact that when there is load shading, for instance, all the switcher switch switches are off. And once they are off, there is absolutely no work in home affairs. And the queues start accumulating. On the issue of being exempted, yes, I have applied for that exemption. I can even show you letters. It's not me who must exempt myself. I must be exempted by whoever is in charge of CETA. And I've written three letters already asking for that type of exemption. So much that we decided to move to another scientific organization, which is busy doing a diagnosis. What is wrong with these systems? Because when we were summoned to the portfolio committee, we outlined the issues that must be done by CETA and the issues that must be done by Home Affairs. And we are doing our part on those things. <laughs> That needs to be done by Home Affairs. So, Chairperson, it is true it's a tragedy uh, uh, about this issue of systems and system downtime. It's something that we don't like, we hate. We are spending sleepless nights, uh, but it's, it's, it's a matter that is in another government department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Minister. Not using CETA, sir. We will now proceed to the next question. And this is question number 279. The question is on court judgment on Zimbabwean exemption permits. Court judgment on Zimbabwean exemption permits. The question comes from Honorable Hihi and is directed to the Minister of Home Affairs. Minister? Chairperson, there are two questions here which don't, are not necessarily related to each other. And, uh, Unfortunately, they've been put together. The first question is about the judgment in the Zimbabwean exemption permit. The second one is about the general immigration system to modernize it. Uh, 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 and so I want to answer them in a separate manner. It is true that the judgment is what it was about the Zimbabwean exemption permit. And it's also true about the judgment that was passed yesterday. Also, in line in, in in the same direction but for now in 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 the issue of the immigration i have said this many times chairperson that we are going to overhaul the whole migration system of the country we're going to overhaul it and i said 
when you overhaul it, you need a policy because there's never been a policy in South Africa. What you have are acts, separate acts, like the Citizenship Act of 1995, the Refugee Act of 1998, and the Immigration Act of 2002, which exist separately. What we are doing now is to come up with a white paper. That will be a policy document to encompass all of them. The cabinet has just approved it last week. We are busy preparing to cassette it. Once we cassette it, it goes out into the public for public comments. And once the public passes that white paper, we want to put up to completely, to completely do away with the Citizenship Act, the Refugee Act, and the Immigration Act, and come up with an omnibus act, as it is uh, the practice around the world. We'll repeal them completely. But we want South Africans first to debate the white paper, which is a founding document of the whole migration system of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. Honorable Hee. Yeah, Minister. Your treatment of the Zimbabwean permit holders is a sign of your deep seated hatred for fellow Africans. As to this day, you still cannot tell us what your actual plan is with the Zimbabwean permit holders. Where do you want them to go? And what steps have you taken to ensure that everyone who should be registered in this country is actually registered? Minister. Chair, there is a very clear plan which we have outside, uh, 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 outlined about the Zimbabwean exemption permit. And we have said many times, and I'm still saying it without fear or favor, you cannot have a system in the country that is temporary, but forever. A system that has been established to solve a temporary problem, but it stays forever. You cannot have that. All I said is that we are stopping the Zimbabwean exemption payment and we are asking them to migrate to all the other visas that exist in the country. And there are 17 of them. There are millions of Zimbabweans in South Africa. Millions. And they've been regulated to be in the country. Well, of course, there are those who are illegal, but there are millions of Zimbabweans who are not illegal. They are not on the ZEP. The ZEP only affects 178,000. All we are saying is let's stop this ZEP, apply for regular visas. And in order to help them, we have done two things. We are exempting them, those who want to apply for the general work visa. We exempt them from the general requirement of going to the Department of Labor to prove to the department that the work they would like to do cannot be done by any South African. That is what the law says. The law passed by this parliament that anybody who wants a general work visa must go to the Department of Employment and Labor first, prove to them that the job was advertised and no South African can perform that work. It's then that they'll bring somebody from outside. At Home Affairs, all they do is to come with a certificate, which is given by the Department of Labor. Zimbabweans on the ZEP, we are exempting them from that requirement, which is a very big step forward. And many have applied, thousands and thousands have applied, and I personally have signed thousands and thousands of exemptions. Once you sign them, then they'll go and apply. Those who are on the applying for the scarce skill, they don't have to go to the Department of Labor. We have gazetted already three times this year the, the scarce skill list. All that we do is to go to that list. If you take a certificate, which shows a profession that is on the scarce skill. We have got no option but to give you a visa, a scarce skill visa. So we do have plans and we are working on them. We are working on the plans and they are very clear. Thank you very much. And, and this issue of losing a court case, if you read that court case, all they said is that I did that without consulting Zimbabweans. That's what they are asking for. They never said the system we are doing is wrong. They said in terms of Paja. I was supposed to go and consult the Zimbabwean first. And because of the manner in which it happened, we have appealed 
will hear what the other higher courts say. That they never said don't do this, don't take this. They said in terms of Paja, this is an administrative action, go and consult. That's what we have appealed against. But while we are appealing, I am not stopping to sign the exemptions for these Zimbabweans who are applying for them. And any one of them who can prove that they've got a job in South Africa, we give them that exemption, even if they might have come illegally at that time. So I want people to understand this whole issue of ZEP because a lot of stories are being bandied around. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, second supplementary question comes from Honorable Boshoff. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, Minister. Thank you for your responses. But, Minister, is your department's proposed termination of the Zimbabwean exemption permits and departmental red tape? Sorry, I just yes, no, please giving please her please the opportunity yeah. to pass. And your departmental's red tape, not just pushing people towards undocumented migration by making Chair, you'll have to speak. <laughs> By making permits scarcer at a time when people can ill afford it. I don't know if I must re um, restate what I said because of all the people passing in front of us. Chair, if you can just yes. on that. No, if you can just um, uh, indicate that uh, it's, 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 it's an established practice. It's also part of our rules that... When a speaker is on the floor, we don't pass in front of um, that person. Uh, so that's, that's what we need to, to stick to. Uh, but my understanding was that the member may be under some pressing uh, difficult situation, and, and therefore we needed to just be a bit more accommodative. Um, uh, but please be reminded that this shouldn't happen. Please proceed. I'm sure the minister got the drift of the follow-up question. Thank you, Chair. Minister? Yeah, I got it. But I want to assure you, in Home Affairs, we don't easily get distracted like you are. We concentrate a lot. Yes, we don't really allow ourselves just to get distracted by small things when we start doing our work. And so for that reason, we are trying, yes, we're trying to do our work very well in that regard. I'm not sure what is meant by visas being scared. South Africa has got 17 types of permits and visas. Show me any country on the planet that has got that number. In fact, in this overhaul of the immigration system, we want to reduce them rather than increase them. It's too much. It's too much. Countries don't work on this. It's an administrative nightmare. To have 17 visas, spousal visa, relatives visa, dependent visa, business visa, study visa, scarce skill visa, retirement visa, and all that. Countries don't work like that. So we, we, we have not made them scarce. There are two main all around. And if you read the report, after Pastor Bushiri got his documents fraudulently from Home Affairs, and you are aware that we have dismissed people who gave those fraudulent documents. You are aware that I hired a team that was chaired by the former director general in the presidency, Mr. Kishias Lubis, Dr. Kishias Lubis, who worked with people who used to work for the Scorpions and the investigators of the Zondo Commission. They all came together and I said every single visa or document that was issued since the Immigration Act came into effect in 2004. They must investigate it. And they did that job. They presented the findings to the portfolio committee. And one of their recommendations is that we need to re-look into these visas because they, they said there is something called forum shopping, meaning a person hops from one visa to the other. You apply for this visa because they are 17. If you don't get uh, uh, what you want, the following day you jump to the other visa. The following day, the other day you jump to the, you know. So we are looking at them. So they are not few. They are actually more than what they should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
Let's proceed to supplementary question number three uh, from Honorable Hart David. Honorable Hart David. Thank you so much, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister. What actionable and stringent methods have you effected to ensure a balance between the need for regularized formal foreign labor in the country and the abuse of our lenient and overstretching laws by foreign nationals? Thank you. Minister? Yes, Chairperson, we, we try our best because we have repeated <laughs> We are not stopping people from visiting South Africa, but we want them to come legally. Even the president said so a few days ago, that we, on we only want people to come here legally. And we'll do everything in our power to make sure that that is so. And part of that includes, as I said, repealing the eggs that apply in that area. The Citizenship Act that we passed in 1995, the Refugee Act we passed in 1998, the Immigration Act we passed in 2002. They need to be re repealed and we start from the beginning. In the white paper that we are going to release, that was approved by Parliament Cabinet, we have outlined 47 judgments in court where our acts were being quoted by the judges, showing that there is something wrong with this act. 47 judgments which throughout the ages government lost because the laws that are there, the laws that are there. And so we are going to try our best because the only thing that we want is people to come in the country legally and announce themselves. At the moment, the system is there, but sometimes it's breached. In terms of the Immigration Act, if you arrive at the borders and say, I'm coming to South Africa, I want to apply for asylum or for refugee status. We are forced to give you what you call a Section 23 permit under the Immigration Act. It says that permit is valid for five days, but within five days you must arrive at the nearest refugee reception center. And we have got five of sub centers. We've got one in Mosina, the biggest one, the Desmond Duty Reception Center in, in Maraba Stad in Twani. We've got one here in Cape Town, and we've just opened the state of the art in Aping. You can go and visit it. It is definitely state of the art, much better than many of our home affairs offices, and is used by foreign nationals who must regularize their stay here. We've opened it just a few months ago, right here in Aping. We've got one in Tabeja, we've got one in Tequini. Once you arrive there, we've got no option but to give you a Section 22 permit under the Refugee Act, which says you are here for a period of three to six months to apply for refugee status. And while you are applying, we give you that permit. If the three months expires before your application has been finalized, you go and renew it. And if you go to Desmond Tutu, there is a kiosk there. You don't have to be in touch with a home affairs official. You just go to the kiosk yourself and renew it. But sometimes people take those and just disappear. Remember, we are one of the few countries, if not the only country, globally and also on the continent, that doesn't put people in camps. We don't put people in camps. They live with us. They interact with us. So if they disappear into the population, you won't know. In other countries, they are locked in a camp. And I want you to understand that South Africa has opted for non-encampment. I know that there is a story of the people here who are in Belleville, and I'm meeting the mayor of Cape Town about that issue. This Friday, they were having a big meeting. They call it the refugee camp. There's no refugee camp in the country. That place was put there to take people away from the streets to run away from COVID, and COVID is over. There's no more COVID. They've got no reason to be there. And there are people who call it the refugee camps. Under what policy? Because South Africa doesn't have refugee camps. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last supplementary question comes from Honorable Mtetwa. Honorable Mtetwa. No, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. And thanks to you, Minister, for the response to this question. We have been elaborate in a number of it 
a number of ways and also educating us. Minister, my question is, <clears throat> uh, are there any problems encountered by immigrants who wish to stay in South Africa legally? If yes, how is this department assisting them, Minister? Beside those that uh, you have said they must apply through Department of Labor, you educated us on those ones. Those that just want to come here legally, how are they going to be assisted, Minister? Obviously, say it will be a lie to have to say any system does not encounter its own problems. It will be a lie. Every system does. Even South Africans who are entitled to IDs and all that do experience some form of problem or the other. But be that as it may, the High Commissioner of Refugees based in Geneva, Mr. Philippe Grande, when he visited South Africa in 2020, he said South Africa has got the most progressive refugee and asylum laws around the whole world. So we do have them. The problems encountered, however, is that quite a number of people who come here and want to regularize themselves are economic migrants. Are economic migrants. Migrants who come from other countries applying for asylum refugee are regularized via international conventions. And there are three of them. The United Nations Convention of 1951, the United Nations Protocol of 1967, and the Organization of African Unity, OAU, Convention of 1969. Then in South Africa is the three acts I've mentioned, citizenship, refugee, and immigration. You can go through all those three conve international conventions and the laws here. None of them talk about economic migration. That is where the problem starts. So for that reason, the RSD also refugee determination officers, refugee status determination officers, when you go there and you mention the issues of refugee or asylum, they go and check those acts and they check the international conventions. If you don't qualify according to them, they reject you. Now, when people are told that you have been rejected, they don't go away, they appeal. And the appeal system in South Africa, which you're also showing in the white paper, is what we call a blue sky approach. It doesn't end. It goes on and on and on. You appeal forever. And if by any chance, you decide that you have exhausted the appeal of process in home affairs. You go to an open court. You start from the beginning. That's why people take up to a decade here in South Africa and you are being blamed for, for having a backlog. The backlog that is there, which even United Nations have accepted on asylum seekers, is people who have been processed and given letters that you don't qualify. But they are staying and they are refused to go. A good example is the people who occupied the Central Methodist Church here in Cape Town, in Central Cape Town. And you know that there was a court case by the Treaters Association and Judge Tulare said they must leave. Now amongst them, there were three ring leaders who have been applying for asylum in South Africa. They took 13 years. And eventually after 13 years, the magistrate ruled that we must take them away back to their country, that they are not asylum seekers, they are lying. As if to prove the magistrate right, one of them, a gentleman by the name of Papi Sakun, when he arrived in the DRC, he tweeted within two weeks that he has formed a political party. A person who has been living here harassing us, saying we, uh, we don't welcome people, he's running away from DRC, he's an asylum seeker, he wants refugee status. You go back to your country, you form a political party, and nobody arrests you because nobody chased you away. But because South African system is a blue sky approach, you were able to spend 13 years. So, so those are the things that we would like to change so that they become very clear and straightforward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Now we move on to question 277. Uh, this question is on establishment of electoral con consultation panel. Establishment of elect electoral 
consultation panel. A question has been asked by uh, uh, FJ, but not, and it's directed to the Minister of Home Affairs. Minister? Yes. Chairperson, yes. There are ongoing consultations with the IEC. Those consultations started long ago, and the names of the preferred candidates will, as required by Section 23 of the Electoral Amendment Act 2013, Act Number 1 of 2023, uh, I mean, sorry, 2023, not 2013, Act Number 1 of 2023, be submitted to the National Assembly for approval. But should I add that you are aware that this Act, which went through this House recently, and was passed by the National Assembly, you are aware that it has been challenged from three fronts by different organizations in the Constitutional Court. The hearing was in August. We are waiting for the final outcome. There's no judgment yet. But at, the, at any rate, the consultations are co co continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. First supplementary question, Honorable Baden host Thank you, Honorable Chair. Seems like another cost order coming your way, Honourable Minister. Um, your failure to establish the electoral reform consultation panel in the time frame prescribed by law has a direct impact on its effective effectiveness. In terms of the law, the deadline for the panel to complete its report is 12 months after the 2024 election. And so every single day its appointment is delayed now is a day less to consider electoral reform options. Consult of the stakeholders and undertake meaningful public participation. So one can only wonder, Minister, why there's these stalling tactics. What does the ANC have against an accountable electoral system? Thank you. There's no stalling Minister. tactics. Okay? There are no stalling tactics altogether. And I'm sure none of us even know the date of the elections. And you are right, it says 12 months after the elections. Which date, we don't know. But I can assure you, I am consulting with the IEC on this matter. And, and, and when the names are there, we will consult with Parliament as the exes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next is Honorable De Brain. Honorable De Brain. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Minister. With the deadline for the establishment of the electoral consultation panel, obviously being before the 2024 elections, to enable the panel to submit recommendations for potential reform within 12 months after the election. Minister, will you commit to this house that the necessary, necessary steps will be processed and that the panel will be established in time before the elections? Can you make that commitment? Yes, indeed, I can. Oh, sorry. Minister, you, please proceed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can make that, but let's get it very clear. This panel is not established for 2024 elections. It is being established for 2029 elections because the 2024 elections will be run in terms of Act Number 1 of 2023 unless the Constitutional Court rules otherwise. And I told you I'm still waiting for, for, <laughs> for the judgment. But for now... The panel is being established to set up processes for 2029 elections. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a mental question. Uh, comes from Honorable Sheikh. Uh, thank you very much, um, Honorable Jefferson. And let me also thank the Honorable Minister uh, for, for the response. And Chair, I don't want to belabor the point because my question is also related to the fact that will the panel uh, be ready and in place in time to do its work for the next elections. And I think the minister has already responded to that. Thank you very much. Minister? Yeah, no, thank you. She is right. The panel will be set up before the 2024 elections, but their work is to work towards a new electoral system for 2029 elections. Thank you. Thank you very much. The fourth supplementary question comes from uh, uh, Honorable Mgausi. Um, thank you, Chairperson of the Council. Um, 
Minister, the reality is that whether you delay um, with this panel or not, uh, elections are going to come and you are not going to be there after the 2024 general elections. Can the minister state here on record that uh, um, the real reasons of stalling the publicizing of these names? Um, if there is, are they political? We all know that anything that is done here is political. But uh, can you assure us that that is not political and why are you stalling uh, publishing um, those names? Thank you. I can assure you that there is nothing political as to whether I am coming back or not after the elections next year. It's neither here nor there. This act is neither here nor there. This act or this panel is not about me. It's about the people of South Africa who will always be there forever and ever and ever, regardless of who is in parliament. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll now proceed to the next question. Question two, uh, sorry, question two, eight, seven. This question is on border management authority, uh, asked by Honorable A. D. Malika and directed to the Minister of Home Affairs. Uh, Minister? Yes, the, the question is about the successes or positive results, rather, that were achieved since the Border Management Authority was established, and indeed there are many. Firstly, the capacity building and personal development. We have to appoint executive ma uh, uh, managers who are running portfolios. You might be aware, Chairperson, that the Border Management Authority, when it was established, it was a branch under the Department of Home Affairs, which means the commissioner or acting commissioner then was acting like a DDG. But from the 1st of April this year, it is a stand-alone entity, stand-alone 3A public entity under the Public Finance Management Act. And as such, from the 1st of April, all the people in the Department of Health, called Port Health Authorities, have been transferred to the Border Management Authority. All the people in the Department of Agriculture who are dealing with agricultural goods at the borders have also been transferred to the Border Management Authority. All the people from the Department of Environment, Fisheries and Forestry who are dealing with fauna and flora, which fauna and flora is allowed to go in and out of the country, have equally been transferred. All the immigration officers under the Department of Home Affairs, those who are based at the borders, have also been transferred. So that work has been done on the 5th of this month, I mean of October rather, you are aware that the president went to Bait Bridge where he launched the Border Management Authority officially as the third law enforcement agency in the country after the South African Defense Force and after, uh, after South African National Defense Force and after the South African Police Services. And in this regard, uh, we have hired a total of 421, I mean, sorry, 200 border guards and 400 new ones are finalizing training, but we have also hired 50 maritime border guards who are going to work at the coast. At the, coast. the other achievement is that we have been planning to redevelop the six priority land ports of entry, being Bait Bridge with Zimbabwe, Libombo with Mozambique, Oshuk with uh, 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 Botswana, I mean Oshuk with Eswatini rather. <coughs> and Kopfontein with Botswana, Maseri Bridge, and Fixpec with Lesotho. We have already issued requests for proposals. The private sector companies that I want to participate because it's a PPP have already visited these borders, and we are waiting for them to submit by, by the end of March next year what their proposals will be. The successes, the border guards were launched on the 14th of July. 
last year. Since they were launched, they've intercepted 35,000 individuals who have been attempting to enter the country illegally through the vulnerable segments of the borderline. And those individuals got arrested, taken to the nearest port of entry, got their fingerprints taken, declared undesirable, and our movement control system has processed the deportation. Furthermore, the BMA officials caught 95,000 individuals who overstayed in the country. That means who came with passports and visas, but allowed them to expire and never went away. And lastly, in that regard, 142 stolen vehicles, high value vehicles, which were about to cross the border were intercepted by the border guards and returned to SAPS for further investigation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Or Malika, first supplementary question. Malika. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Can you allow me not to switch on my video due to the unstable network? And, Please uh, proceed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for your comprehensive uh, response to my question. Honorable Minister, as we have said in the past that the Border Management Act is not the silver bullet, but will stop all our difficulties with the border management. But it will go a long way in assisting us to manage our borders. My question, uh, Honorable Minister, the redevelopment of the six major land ports of entry into one-stop border post assist in the overall border management. Thank you, Chairperson. Minister? Yes, it, it will indeed assist. I'm sure you are aware that the African Union has already passed with pomp and ceremony the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. That free trade agreement wants well-functioning borders. As the borders are now between South Africa and its neighbors and many other destinations on the continent, you get processed twice when you arrive at the border. If you are going to Botswana, South Africa processes you this side, takes long, then you cross no man's land and you arrive on the Botswana side, they also process you. The one-stop one border post will abolish that. You get processed only once. The systems are such that they are integrated within the countries and uh, you, you, you get processed once. Long before the BMA was formed, when the act or the, was still a bill being debated in parliament, I visited all the neighboring countries. We met at the borders to discuss the mode of one-stop border post. And there were three to choose from. There is something called the juxtapose model. In the juxtapose model, when you go to Zimbabwe, for instance, South Africa doesn't process you. You just pass through as if it's not a border. You get processed on the Zimbabwean side because you are entering their country. When you come back, Zimbabwe doesn't process you. They just allow you to go through. They don't even ask you questions. Then you get processed on the South African side. That is the method that we have chosen uh, throughout the whole of SADC. And when we establish a one-stop border post, it will be along those lines. The, the, the infrastructural development chairperson is going to be very, very helpful. Just to give you an example, we are saying any one of these companies that are now visiting the borders to put up the infrastructure, they must also put modern technology. And one of the modern technologies we are demanding is gamma ray technology, where a truck drives through. The old method is to use X-rays, but they are absolute. Where a truck drives through that gamma ray technology, and you can see everything that is inside the truck. In fact, when President Ram uh, Ramaphosa was at the border at Bay Bridge, together with President Mnangagwa, they demonstrated a scanner that is going to act along the same lines, where there was a truck carrying cargo, and it was shown on the street, on the screen. On the custom papers is written bananas. In fact, when you check on that screen, the back part, a very small part of the truck, is carrying bananas, but the rest of the truck is counterfeit cigarettes. You can't catch that if you don't have that type of system. 
and we are going to install it. You may be aware that some two or three years back, uh, there was a, a, a something on social media which was breaking our heart. A truck going through the Bombo border post into Mozambique full of br brooms to the brim. But when those brims are, brooms are removed, there was a, a, a van, a panel van parked there. It was going to cross into Mozambique. Now it is a policeman who suspected and searched. We don't want to live through suspicions. We want that truck to drive through a gamma ray machine and everything that is inside will be seen. Not only opaque objects, the gamma ray is capable of seeing even cash. It's capable of seeing paper, paper money. It's capable of seeing even alcohol. It's capable to see cigarettes and all those things. And that's why we are going to, we are busy installing, going to install at the borders. All we need is for the company that wins the bid. Companies rather, because they are going to be many, that win the bid to go and look for that type of technology. Thank you.